ասեքնել ասաջարով եկցիատ, թե մազ է ադամիանի սերծիս մրիշնելով ախալ շովրին հացրայումի սասարգելու բակտերի է միտ գամբի տրեպաշի։ Ալի անդիսնովիլի աղիարելուլի ադամիանի է, մերծում է թրում տալի Dr. Zach Lewis, is it correct to say your name? Not yet. 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 Not yet.
if it is if it is wasteful or not needed, it is taken away. By so we can consider milk to be a, a, a wonderfully evolved food with many, many, many surprises and sort and think many, many more reasons for studying milk in terms of uh, discovery. So milk, of course, involves the mother, it involves the host, but it also involves the microbi microbiota inside the gastrointestinal tract of the infant. And we like to call this the milk-oriented microbiota, or mom. So it is your, your second mom, not your first mom. So what is human milk composed of? Mostly water. And then there's macro and micronutrients. If you look at them, many of them make sense. Lactose, lipids, protein. The infant needs this for food. So the infant needs those nutrition. <coughs> there's also another component. It's an HMOs. They stand for human milk oligosaccharides. They're very complex oligosaccharides. I'll talk about them. The infant cannot eat cannot consume the human milk oligosaccharides. If you think about the components of human milk, or any animal milk, that are devoted to not necessarily nutrition, but the microbiota inside the infant, there's lots. We, we already know there's immunoglobulins in milk, there's lysozyme, lactoferrin, these are all for the purposes of changing the mi microbes inside the GI tract. Um, certain fatty acids are antimicrobial. They change, they change the microbes inside the infant. So we already know that milk delivers microbially suppressive character, lysozyme, lactoferrin, etc. cetera. Um, but it also delivers many of these complex human milk oligosaccharides and they are either free or they are connected to proteins. Here you have N-linked glycoproteins, O-linked glycoproteins, or glycolipids. All of the enzymatic machinery necessary to consume these sugars, the infant does not have. But the infant microbiota does have. So evolutionary, 200 million years of evolutionary process delivered these structures very purposely for the infant microbiota. Lots of complex structures. You need lots of enzymes. Um, we at UC Davis uh, have been studying human milk oligosaccharides for since 2003. And I'm very fortunate that I, I work with Carlito Labria, who's really the world's leading glycochemist in, the in, in, in understanding the structural complexity of these complex oligosaccharides, human oligosaccharides of any sort. But he's particularly good at human milk oligosaccharides. If you look at human milk, first and foremost, uh, these are the kinds of structures you have. This is a fucose. Uh, so a fucose is connected to either a, a lactoembios uh, uh, um, or a lactosamine core. And so they either have fucose or silic acid. This is not an, this is this particular structure does not exist in nature. I'm only showing it to show you the different kinds of linkages that is, that uh, are present in human milk. Uh, they're not digestible by the human. They're very they're quite variable. Fucose is is on 40 to 70 percent of the oligosaccharides present in human milk. Silic acid is a smaller percentage. And there's actually, this number I need to change, there's actually 500 different species. So humans deliver many, many of these oligosaccharides to their infants. Mothers deliver them to their infants. Um, so why? Why would 200 million years of evolution result in so many oligosaccharides? So there's lots of hypotheses. The first most obvious hypothesis is they're there to deflect pathogens. These structures look like the structures of the glycans that are on the surface of, epithelial, of your epithelial cells, like in your intestine. So if E. coli wants to bind to an epithelial cell, it binds to the glycans 
on the epithelial cell. Well, if mother is producing milk and the infant is consuming milk, then the infant is consuming many, many glycans. The E. coli will bind that milk glycan <coughs> instead and, and go out, out the infant. So there's a protection that way. There's lots of, uh, of data to suggest that, that these glycans stimulate the immune system, and particularly the silic acid is important for brain development in, in infants. So there's a lot of silic acid that needs to move to the brain for brain development in infants. In my laboratory at UC Davis, we've been studying whether these glycans enrich a specific gut microbiome. So the structural diversity here is very different. You might be familiar with the term prebiotic. Prebiotic, are you familiar with that? You're familiar with the term probiotic? Probiotic? Prebiotics, of course, are, are resistant sugars that are thought to enrich probiotic-like species in your gut. These are the most common commercial prebiotics. Uh, galacto oligosaccharide or fructo oligosaccharide. They are not similar to human milk. This is just a sample, and you can see the structural diversity, and yet the people who make these try to claim very similar to human milk. They're not similar at all. You can see for yourself, the structures are very different. I only need one enzyme to, to consume this. If I'm a bacterium, I need one enzyme. For this, I need many. So they're not the same. Even though people who sell prebiotics will say they're the same. They're not, they're not. So in infants, what are the bacteria that are enriched? In breastfed infants, this is a study done by Jeff Gordon, a very famous uh, intestinal microbiologist in the United States. He studied uh, the feces from humans at all ages, age, in the first year of life to, to old, older ages, and he went all the way up to 80 years old. He collected many, many different people's feces, and he analyzed the microbiota content. And one of the things he noticed was that in the early years of life, during breastfeeding and weaning, the microbiota content, content is very variable, changing. But after about three years old, it stabilizes, all the way up to 80 years old. And he published a paper very recently that suggested some of the strains that you get when you're young, after three years old, are the same strains that you have when you're 80. And, and so it's, it's a very uh, long-lived relationship with our gut microbiota. He studied the very early stage, between zero and first year of life, and one of the things he noticed is that most of the sequences that he looked at, and he was using metagenomic sequencing analysis, were bifidobacteria. Bifidobacteria, it's a, it's a, uh, a species that was discovered more than 100 years ago, commonly associated with breastfed infants by, by microscopy, by Tissier uh, at around 1900. So most of the most bifidobacteria are associated. So why? Why would nature select one organism? Um, well, there's some ideas. People use bifidobacteria as probiotics. So there's lots of studies on bifidobacteria. One example is this. This is a nature paper from a couple of years ago where a Japanese group was testing different probiotics, different bifidobacterial probiotics, for which probiotic could defend against an E. coli 0157H7 infection. So they would, they would feed the mouse bifidobacteria and then they would try to infect with E. coli. And in many cases, uh, so here's, here's what happened to the mouse with no probiotic. Uh, the mouse died, this is survival rate over days. And here is a, this one is B. anomalous, a bifidobacteria that did not help the mouse survived, and another bifidobacteria, this one is B. longum, it helped the mouse survive. And they were trying to understand why, so they sequenced the genomes of the protective and the non-protective bifidobacteria, and they noticed it was simple sugar utilization, utilization of fructose, that was the difference. So the genes necessary to utilize fructose made all the difference. And the organisms that could use fructose 
produced more acetate. Acetate in the, in the colon lowered the pH, more protective. They did a wonderful job. But, but when, when I look at this data and I think about mothers and milk and breastfed infants, that tells me that if a bifida bacteria can grow on a very special sugar that is in the colon, it'll produce acetic acid and it'll be protective. We have some other evidence on why bifidobacteria might be protected. This is a study that we were doing in Bangladesh with uh, some colleagues, uh, both in Bangladesh and at the Western Human Nutritional Research Center. <coughs> this is a study of vaccination in the first year of life. And the, act, the study actually is focused on vitamin A. And so they give some infants vitamin A, and they don't give other infants vitamin A uh, supplements, and then they're testing the vaccine response. Normal vaccines, polio, all the normal first year vaccines. Well, we sequence the microbiota of the same children. We have fecal samples at six weeks, 11 weeks, 15 weeks. And you can see, this is the, the representation of the microbiota. Bifidobacteria are represented in the actinobacteria clade. And you can see how much bifidobacteria are present in these infants. And some infants do not have them. They have other bacteria. In all cases, the vaccine responses were better in the infants that had more bifidobacteria. So a bifidobacterial dominated microbiota in these infants was associated with a stronger immune system, more responsive immune system. So we wanted to ask the question, does the milk from the mother, mothers represent different genotypes, does the milk from the mother result in different types of bifidobacterial enrichments. Well, milks from mothers can actually be different. And one of the ways they can be different in the, in the glycans is the presence of the secretor gene or the, or the absence of that gene or the mutation in that gene. And what it does is it results in you have glycans that either have a 1-2 fucosyl linkage or you don't have it. And it's because you either have a mutant FUG2 gene or you have a, a wild type FUG2 gene. I personally am a non-secretor. I've had my DNA looked at and it's a very easy test. Uh, uh, but most of Caucasians, most white people like me, Caucasians, uh, I think about 80% are secretors. I'm a non-secretor. And so different mothers might deliver milk that either have this or this in their, in their various milk glycans. This has already been associated with health. In a study in Mexico uh, back in the early 90s, a group, uh, Ardeth Moro, determined that uh, children of mothers who were secretors so they had the two fucosyl linkage, had lower amounts of Campylobacter, lower amounts of Calicivirus-based diarrhea, and lower diarrhea in general. And the only difference between the mothers was the, the secretor versus non-secretor. Now Zach, in my lab, has been studying this influence on, on, a, on a cohort that we have at UC Davis. We have collected, uh, we have collected lots of feces from breastfed infants at UC Davis, many, many. Uh, but we took a subset of that. We had 48 breastfed infants and we had four time points. And Zach has looked at the microbiota of those infants. And we also know the secretor or the non-secretor type of milk that that infant was fed. So we know the secretor status or the non-secretor status of the mother. Now when Zach looked at the population of, of, of children that he had, 48 breastfed infants, four time points. And he just looked at the percent bifidobacteria of, of ratio versus the log bifidobacteria by quantitative PCR. He noticed there were really two populations. There was a low bifidobacterial population, and there was a high bifidobacterial population. And there was a space in between, the low and the high. And we were curious about that. Uh, so some infants had very little bifidobacteria. They obviously had other, micro, other microbes in their, in their GI tract. And some had very high amounts. 
Well, it turns out, if you look at this data another way, this is a principal coordinate uh, analysis where each point represents the diversity of microbes in one fecal sample from one infant. So in a sense, we can describe the whole microbiota from one infant in one point uh, in space. And we can compare it to the whole microbiota from another infant at another time point. And the closer they are together, the more similar the diversity of microbes in that sample are. The farther apart that they are, the more different that they are. And one of the things we noticed, uh, red is infants who got secretor milk, blue is infants who got non-secretor milk, is that there's a big cluster of red here. And these were all the infants that had a high amount of bifidobacteria. And again, red means secretor. There's a big amount of blue here. And these infants were more often high in strep, clostridia, and Orobacteraceae. And then there's another group that were high in bacteroides. But you can easily see that there's a large cluster uh, of bifidobacteria high infants that got had secretor, secretor milk. If you look at it another way, the secretor mothers or the secretor milk infants had more bifidobacteria on average, whereas the non-secretor had more E. coli, more strep. So there's a difference. We see a statistical difference between the two. You can look at it one more way. This is the percent of babies where the bifida is 10 to the 9th cells per, per gram of feces. The percent of babies, and this is the day. And you can see over time, a secretor, a baby getting secretor milk has more bifidobacteria established right from the beginning, and it moves up faster. Non-secretor is lower. So there's a functional difference between secretor and non-secretor. Uh, and we're writing this up uh, into a paper now. Oh, and we even know the different species that are associated with a secretor mom and a non-secretor mom. So maybe a non-secretor milk selects a certain type of bifidobacteria, and a secretor milk selects another. We have ideas on why. So Zach isolated the, the bifidobacteria from these feces. He isolated the bifidobacteria, and he tested them for growth on the two fucosyl lactose which of course you would have to be able to break this down if you're going to if you if you're getting if you're consuming secretor milk. And more of the bacteria that were isolated from secretor babies could grow on the two fucosyl lactose in a, in a strong way than were isolated from the non-secretor. Again, this is phenotypic physiological evidence to suggest that this that what we're studying is true. So if human milk oligosaccharides are prebiotics, natural prebiotics, can we see them being consumed? So this is a study we've, we've, we're, we've uh, submitted for publication, where we, we took feces from a breastfed infant, and my lab looked at the microbial ecology, and then Carlito Labria's lab looked at the glycans that remained in the feces, so the milk glycans that's, that remained in the feces. And you can see, this is, this is a mass, uh, mass spec plot. Uh, so here we have week one, week two, week four, week 12. These represent different mass to charge ratios. They determine the glycan structures using a mass spectrometer. And so you, you get different mass to charge ratios for different species, different sp species of, of milk glycans. So for instance, here's, I don't know, 10, 12 different compositions of milk glycans. And we normalize to the first week, and then we watch it over time. And you can see it decreases from week two to week 12. My lab looked at the microbiota, and sure enough, by week 12, there was a lot of bifidobacteria. So as bifidobacteria went up, the milk glycans went down in the feces. So we see a good correlation. And that's actually bifidobacterium longum. But Carlito Labria's lab is very sophisticated. So each one of these mass to charge ratios could represent multiple different isomers. 
So there might be a 1-4 linkage, or a 1-2 linkage, or a 1-3 linkage. They all have the same molecular weight. So he can tell me this 1-4 linkage is actually not being consumed. But these linkages are actually being consumed. So we have very specific knowledge on which structure in human milk is being consumed and which is not. We are profiling lots and lots of infants and trying to match very specifically against the bifida bacteria. OK, if human milk oligosaccharides are prebiotics, we have a couple more questions. Do different bacteria that are isolated from your GI tract grow on human milk oligosaccharides? Well, we tested a variety of them, Clostridia, Lactobacterium, Lactobacilli, etc. Most did not grow on human milk oligosaccharides as a sole carbon source. Bacteroides grew well, and bifidobacteria grow well. Bacteroides is often found in an infant, but it's not dominant. It's often found in this. We tested different bifidobacterial species, like B. infantis, B. bifidum, B. longum, B. breve. These are all found in infants, commonly. Um, and, and we tested them on human milk oligosaccharides as well as different individual sugars that are common in human milk. B. infantis grows on everything. B. bifidum uh, grew on most of the human milk oligosaccharides. And B. longum and B. breve were much more variable. So B. infantis is our model for an organism that grows on human milk oligosaccharides. We wanted to know which oligosaccharides were consumed. This is work done by Rick, Ricky Lacostio. We grow B. infantis on human milk oligosaccharides, and here's some other organisms, B. breve, B. longum. This represents different mass to charge ratios that are present in cooled, cooled human milk. So the first mass to charge ratio represents 20% of the glycans in, in the milk, etc. You can see that most of the oligosaccharides, most of the glycans present in cooled human milk are small oligosaccharides. They represent by this amount right here. When we took a sample from right here and we assayed how many oligosaccharides are still remaining in the supernatant, these were all gone. B. infantis consumes all the small, all the complex oligosaccharides. These other two? only consume this first one, just a little bit, about half. So there's difference in bifidobacteria. Some bifidobacteria can consume these oligosaccharides well, others do not. We now do much more extensive isomer mapping. I won't get into it now, but we do much more extensive isomer mapping now on lots of the different isomers in, in mom's milk. And we are mapping different bifidobacteria against different milks. This is some work by a, a former postdoc in my lab who moved to Justin Sonnenberg's lab. And she tested, in collaborating with us, she tested notobiotic mice, so mice with no microbes associated at all. And they put inside the mouse Bifidobacterium infantis, and they put a Bacteroides strain inside the mouse. So there's only two microorganisms inside the gut of that mouse. And they fed it normal mouse chow with uh, uh, normal mouse chow. When they fed normal mouse chow, uh, the um, Bacteroides represented 90% of the population, and Bifidobacterium infantis represented 10%. But if they added lacto and neotetros, that's one of the human milk oligosaccharides, if they added lacto and neotetros to the water of the mouse cave, all of a sudden, Bifidobacterium infantis was nearly 90 to 100 percent. As soon as they changed the water and took it out of the water, went back down, put the water, put it back in the water, goes back up. Clearly, this is this is an organism that can compete very well in a mouse for these sugars. So we were wondering what genes are responsible for the human milk oligosaccharides, and so we've sequenced many, actually many many strains. But back in 2008, we sequenced B. infantis. And it's, it was rather easy to find the genes involved in human milk oligosaccharide consumption, because you simply have to look for a fucosidase, sialidase, galactosidases, hexaminidases. These are enzymes that are specific to consuming human milk oligosaccharides, or transporting the oligosaccharides inside the cell. And it was very easy to find, because it was all in one place. 
all of the genes were in a 40 kb uh, uh, cluster, uh, where you have sialidase, fucosidase, galactosidase, hexaminidase. You have transport proteins. And so everything was in one spot. And so it allowed us to predict a model where you have extracellular proteins that bind to the, to the glycans that come along. And they, they shepherd them through a permease. And once inside the cell, they are broken down by the various glycosyl hyperlases. So it's made, made for a very simple model. We've also done some additional functional characteristics. Um, we've done whole cell RNA-seq, and we've done proteomics to determine that only certain genes are expressed when the cell is growing on human milk oligosaccharides. So specifically ones associated with fucosidase and sialidase, which makes sense, because you have to cleave off the sialic acid and the fucose if you're going to consume this. Um, the expression pattern on human milk oligosaccharides is different than the other prebiotics that companies sell. So for a company to say that a prebiotic is similar to human milk, it's not, again, not by structure, not by physiology. Uh, so it's, uh, the different prebiotics act differently with these bacteria. And then we mapped every single enzyme. This is, this is two PhDs worth of work in one slide. So it's unfair. But two PhDs in one slide, we, we mapped all the fucosidases, we purified every enzyme, we characterized the kinetics, and we walked through the, the metabolism of this organism. One interesting aspect were these extracellular binding proteins. So again, they stick outside of the cell and they bind to oligosaccharides. And in, oops, in the HMO cluster, all of these binding proteins cluster together versus all of the binding proteins from bifidobacteria were out here, suggesting these were unique in some way. So we cloned and characterized, well first we examined their gene expression, their 20 in B. infantis, and we looked for when we grew B. infantis on HMO, which site binding protein was turned on. And there were only four turned on, three of which were inside that cluster. So that suggests that they're related to human milk oligosaccharide consumption. We cloned and purified all 20, and we took them and we sent them to a facility in the, in the United States in Atlanta called the, the Consortium for Functional Glycomics. And they have a, an array of glycans. So it's, a, it's like a microarray, but not DNA. It's glycans, it's oligosaccharides that are sitting on the array. So here's an array, and you have uh, 370 something glycans sticking out of the array. And then you take a, a binding protein and you throw it at the array, and if it binds, there's a fluorescence uh, readout, and you get a peak like this. And then you simply have to go back to the array and figure out, well, what was the type of sugar that was on this spot, and here's what the structure was. So we took the binding proteins that we know were associated with human milk oligosaccharide growth and we bound them to this array, and sure enough, they bind sugars that look like human milk oligosaccharides. But, but they also look like sugars that are on the surface of your epithelium. So, if infants are enriched in bifidobacteria, we would expect the growth on human milk oligosaccharides to help them persist in the intestine. They sh the growth on human milk oligosaccharides we would predict should help them persist, to bind and persist and help the host. So, once again, if these binding proteins bind to glycans that are on the epithelial surface. So we tested that. Unfortunately, you can't see it because of the light, but we, we tested one of them. This one is 2347, and it bound to the surface of CACO2 cells. So it does bind the glycans that are on the epithelial surface. And then we tested if you grew the cells, the bifidobacteria, on the human milk oligosaccharides, do the cells bind tighter to CACO2 cells or, or intestinal cells? And that's exactly what we see. B. infantis, when grown on human milk oligosaccharides, binds better to CACO2 cells or HG29 cells than the same strain, same genome grown on lactose. 
The only difference is from sugar growth. This is actually a, a, an interesting point that the probiotics industry does not pay attention to. When the probiotics industry tests intestinal binding of some probiotic, they grow it on glucose. And glucose is not available in your intestine. We should be paying attention to what sugar is available in your intestine if we want to focus on binding of a probiotic to your intestinal cells. I think we're, the industry, I think, is focused in the wrong area. Um, we also, and I don't have time to show this, we also showed that an HMO grown B infantis induces tight junction proteins in a positive way. Tight junctions are, are barrier function proteins. It also stimulates uh, IL-10, anti-inflammatory cytokines. So this all makes sense on why an infant who is hypersensitive, a developing infant, the intestine is hypersensitive uh, to inflammation. And it's always kept down. And it's kept down because of milk and bifidobacteria, in my opinion. OK, so we have a model where we have many different organisms uh, fighting inside an intestine of an infant. And but the mother is providing all of these glycan structures that make it all the way down to the colon of the infant. And bifidobacteria is able to deploy specific binding proteins and bind and consume these glycan. But by doing so, it can also bind better to the intestine and persist. So it, it can compete better. So we think that complex milk glycans enhance the specific or efficacy of specific bifidobacteria as a probiotic. This is all fundamental knowledge. We were, we, I have NIH grants to study the basic biology of this system. So everything I've presented to you so far is about the basic biology, fundamental discovery. But in the United States now, NIH is very focused on translation. Can you make a good application of this fundamental knowledge? Uh, and I work in the Foods for Health Institute, and I'm also part of a new mucosal health center. We want to be able to take this technology and move it to a reality. So this is our project at UC Davis. It's all human milk research. But when we started this project, at the same moment, we also started studying bovine milk. Because the idea would be we would find components in human milk that we could then source in bovine milk. Because of course, you, you can't buy human milk. It's not for sale in the grocery store. Um, but bovine milk, there's a lot. And so we can try to identify bioactive molecules. And I've shown you that there's prebiotic milk oligosaccharides, for instance, in bovine milk that look very similar to the ones in human milk. Uh, I've identified bifidobacteria that grow on human milk oligosaccharides, and we are matching them with bovine milk oligosaccharides. We've actually screened bovine milk oligosaccharides. I, I, li I live not too far from the largest cheese facility in the world. It's called Hillmar Cheese. It's three hours south of where I live near Sacramento. It processes 13 million gallons of milk a day, every day. The amount of cheese whey that that facility produces is humongous. And we, can, we are working with them to purify bovine milk oligosaccharides of many different types so that we can maybe test them for helping babies and other aspects. We have a milk processing lab at UC Davis where we're doing this. We've now been testing these bovine milk oligosaccharides, and they also are protective. In this case, it's in mouse models. We were testing a mouse model for intestinal permeability, barrier function. And there's three different tests you can do, electrical conductance, paracellular permeability, and transcellular permeability. We're using a, a mouse model where you literally uh, feed the mouse either a normal chow diet or a, what we call a Western diet. And a Western diet is very bad for the mouse intestine. It creates a very permeable intestine. As you can see, there's a normal chow, here's a Western diet. Western diet has higher electrical conductance, higher paracellular, and higher transcellular permeability. If you add B. infantis and, and bovine milk oligosaccharides back to the diet, you almost restore it to the normal child levels. 
suggesting that this is a positive effect on the mouse. We've also tested protection from salmonella infection. And if you feed bovine milk oligosaccharides and B. infantis, you have a lower amount of infection from salmonella. So the, these ideas are, can be translated. So we have a whole bunch of process activities going on, but where can we really help? Where can we help the most sensitive, fragile people? Where do you need uh, what we say is a protective mom? And again, this is the bifidobacterial <coughs> enriched mom. Well, I think the best example is premature infants. Premature infants uh, are on the, uh, the, the incidence of premature birth in the United States and actually around the world is going up in great numbers, great numbers, around the world. And they're born, they're very small, very, they're the size of my hand, uh, very small babies. They have, they have underdeveloped immune systems, they have underdeveloped lungs, underdeveloped uh, gastrointestinal tracts. We've been working, and surprisingly, the food that is fed to premature infants has not changed dramatically in 30 years. The technology around saving premature infants has changed dramatically, but the food has not changed dramatically in 30 years. So we tested, uh, we're working with Mark Underwood. He runs the neonatal intensive care unit at UC Davis. And we wanted to test if we fed a premature infant B. infantis, which we know grows on human milk oligosaccharides really well, or another bifidobacterium probiotic. This one we'll call B. lactis, a very common probiotic that's sold in many, many yogurts today. And B. lactis we use as our negative control for growth on human milk oligosaccharides. It doesn't grow at all. And so we, we fed the infant uh, a couple of different ways, and I'll show you the, the results. This is funded by NIH. So some infants got formula because they did not have a mother's milk available, and so they have no choice but to feed the infant in the premature ward formula. So we fed them B. infantis plus formula. So here's an example of a child who was fed formula and B. infantis, and you notice here is the baseline. This is week three, week four. This is the amount of B. infantis, 10 to the minus or 10 to the, maybe 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 8th, something. Uh, but a small percentage of the total bacteria that are present in the infant GI tract. So even though we could see the B. infantis that we were adding, it was not dominant. It was not the predominant bifidobacteria, like what happens in a normal term child. It was very different when we tested in premature infants fed their mother's milk. So here is an example of, of one patient. It was fed, it was a human milk fed infant, so it was fed its mother's milk. And we, we had a baseline amount of bifidobacteria that was around 10 to the 6th, 7th. Then we fed B. infantis, and immediately we saw B. infantis dominating that environment. We then did a washout where we fed no probiotic. The, the baby still got the mother's milk, but we fed no probiotic. And even during the washout, we saw that the B. infantis that we put in the child was dominating. Then we tried, tried to put in the Bifidobacterium lactis, a strain that does not grow on human milk oligosaccharides. We tried to put it into the infant. We couldn't see it. All we saw was B. infantis. So this is a direct competition, in a sense. And we could not, the B. infantis persisted. We think we have found a way with smart choosing of probiotic strains to greatly help infants in the premature infant work by simply combining the infantis with mother's milk, which is the preferred, preferred diet for all children in the premature infant wards. But this technology can be applied anywhere. There, it doesn't take much to apply this. You just have to buy the probiotic or get or make the probiotic. Um, I think this is going to become standard of care in the United States. I think uh, very soon only using human milk in the premature infant uh, uh, wards in the United States is going to become the standard of care. 
and, it, and that, that's going to happen quite soon because the results are very good that just using human milk is much better than formula. But I think the next thing behind that is going to be using a probiotic that grows on the human milk glycans. I think we can save children this way. And I love this because it does, it, it, you don't need technology to apply this. You just need to grow the bacteria and make it. And you can buy it and make it in every country. So it's a very accessible, potential, life-saving solution. So, my take-home points. We are using milk as a model for how to establish a microbiome. <coughs> to give us some of the rules for how is a microbiome changed in your intestine and how is it established. We think that the specificity of the modulation of, of the microbes in your gut are changed by glycans that you consume, particularly early in life. And that we're exploiting that knowledge to understand partnerships between specific glycans and specific probiotics. And I think if we put those two together, we can deliver more effective products. And that's one of the, one of the projects we have right now uh, here, is, is to do just that, to find a very specific glycan and a very specific probiotic and hopefully put them together and get them to persist in an animal. We're also using it to, to identify new glycan processing tools as well. I didn't talk too much about that. So I want to thank all the students in my lab over the years. These are, this is not just my lab, but there's five different professors involved in this project. Uh, actually, more than five now. Um, and the professors are up here. The students are in bold who did all the work that I presented. Uh, and I also want to thank the various uh, funding agencies. We've had a, uh, we've been very fortunate. We've had a lot of funding to, to work on this. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. occurred uh, not that long ago actually in northern Europe and that's what allowed that gene to stay on and, and allowed them to not be lactose intolerant. So this particular secretor, non-secretor, is not related to the same same gene that's involved in yes, lactose intolerance. Yes, because we have such differences in the same yeah. population. And so the secretion is determined genetically? Mm -hmm. Is it gene specific? It's a single gene. It's it's easy to sequence. Uh, I know I'm a non-secretor. It's easy to sequence. It's easy to. If I was going to be a mother, I'd want to know. I'm not going to be a mother, <laughs> but uh, it's a good gene to figure out. Just a quick question um, regarding the delivery mechanisms for the probiotics. Are you looking at any other mediums besides uh, just pure milk? Maybe other milk products. To deliver. So, what what mechanism will we deliver the bifidobacteria yes. in the infants? You know. Uh, for in the premature infant ward, so in the in the in the neonatal intensive care unit, we simply have a freeze dried uh, culture of B infantis, and they they hydrate it and put it right in the food for the infants. So there isn't a, a normal formulation that that probiotic companies will do, 
And I don't think for the premature infant ward you really need it because you'll have nurses who can take it right from a freezer, formulate it, and give it. It doesn't have to sit somewhere for a long time. And you want to formulate it into a food if you, if you think it's going to sit on the shelf for a long time. You also mentioned about the growing, uh, uh, just the problem with the early birth of uh, the mothers in different countries. Uh, and um, it's also the with age. Like as, uh, As a mother gets older, yeah. there's more premature. Yes. Yeah. And the tendency nowadays is that uh, they uh, mothers decide to uh, make families later in life. Yeah. Yes. So um, just um, were there any studies that you see or just what kind of uh, levels was there before? Uh, so, uh, Wait, 100 years ago or no, no, 50 no, years ago? No. Not, not 50 years ago, but uh, mothers that, uh, for example, uh, in their milk, the, the, the breast milk, just mother, what the contents were, uh, are, uh, and mothers that are in So that's a good question. Is there a different milk, or is maybe there are different microbes delivered in the yes. milk of an older mother versus a younger mother? Yeah. I don't know of any studies that, do, that looked at that. I, I don't think the milk glycans would be so different. I'd be surprised if the milk, the milk oligosaccharides were different. Uh, the bacteria that are delivered in milk are involved in colonizing the baby, but we don't know how much. There's a lot of bacteria in milk because yes. there's a lot of exposure. But I, most of those are strep, streptococci, staphylococci, skin, skin organisms that are found in milk. There's some different bacteria too. But how much, how important the microbes delivered in milk are for the infant? I'm not sure. So, so nobody has done the study on the, the old mother or young mother, so I have no answer for that. But even the microbes, I'm not convinced that the microbes delivered in milk are that important. I have to be convinced. I have four questions, and I believe there are much more than other four. The reason is that we have time to start a new lecture. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank you.